We're going to have a great third quarter. Third quarter is going to be tremendous numbers, fourth quarter likewise. And next year, economically, will be one of the best years we've ever had. U.S. President Donald Trump expresses optimism as COVID-19 continues to cut a devastating path across the country. Hello, I'm Arnold Neider, and this is The Heat. On Monday, the United States surpassed more than 60,000 new coronavirus cases for the first time in a single day. Across the country, more than a third of U.S. states reported record highs in new daily cases. The growing numbers come as many small and large businesses declared bankruptcy this year. Well, there's much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Mehmet Osman Jostkun is the owner of East West Coffee Wine in Northern Virginia. His business is struggling despite a partial reopening in his area. Joining us from Truro, Massachusetts is Betsy Stevenson. She served as an economic advisor in the Obama administration and is currently a professor of public policy and economics at the University of Michigan. And also with us is my colleague, CGTN's Jim Spellman. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Jim, let me start with you. As we just heard there from President Trump, he is very upbeat about the U.S. economy, saying that there will be great figures in the third and fourth quarters. Where does this optimism come from, given that many of the markers that we look at every day are pointing in the other direction? Well, President Trump and the White House point first to jobs. Now, obviously, COVID-19 has meant millions of Americans losing jobs, but that progress seems to have stopped and has made back some of uh, the jobs that had been lost. The second thing they point to is the stock market, always an important indicator for President Trump, and perhaps now more than ever. But the thing here that's essential to remember is so much of this is about the election. President Trump really needs the economy to be in good shape. This is what he wanted to run on in the beginning before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. It's one of the few issues that takes his election past the base of his voters into potential swing voters in those vital suburban areas. So he's really got to at least either turn around the economy or create the perception that he has on it. So, Jim, I guess when we hear these comments from the president, we should see it through the prism uh, of the election, uh, through a political prism, really. A absolutely. And so much of the response to COVID-19 is, is through that exact prism. So you saw this, uh, this urging from President Trump for businesses to reopen a, a month, two months, three months ago. And that's partly what's behind the current uh, rise in cases. But, but the problem with really waiting out a longer uh, term shutdown is that that does damage the U.S. economy in the short term. But reopening now, we can see, is going to cause more problems. California just today closing restaurants, bars once again. But there's less than four months to the election. The president doesn't have enough time to wait for all of that to play out the way public health officials might like. That, critics would say, has led to rushing some of these decisions. But we've seen time and again here in the United States that COVID-19 is a public health issue that doesn't care about what the political stakes are. Anand? Uh, Betsy Thompson, of course, there's a big focus on the impact that the pandemic is having on the United States economy. It is the world's biggest economy. There are some economic analysts, some of them were quoted in the Washington Post, as saying that uh, there could be what's called a V-shaped recovery. That's a very uh, sharp um, collapse in the economy and a very sharp recovery. Do you st still see that happening? I don't think there's anyone who still sees that happening. I mean, the United States has had a very big increase in cases that's led uh, to new shutdowns. Um, but the reality is the research shows that what, what prevented people from going out was not state policy. It was actually fear of contagion, uh, knowing that they could get exposed to the virus. And with cases surging, a lot of people are still really um, acting in a very protective way. Whether the restaurants are open or not, many people aren't going. And it's that behavior that's constraining uh, uh, consumer spending uh, that is preventing a lot of businesses from being able to get up off the ground uh, and get back going again. We did see um, jobs recover somewhat in, in the latest jobs report 
But I think we need to be really careful there, because if you look deeply into that report, what you saw was an acceleration in permanent job loss. So we had some people who had been temporarily laid off who were brought back to work as uh, businesses started to reopen in the many states that were reopening at the time. What we haven't seen over the last four weeks is an increase in reopening. So if we look at the next jobs report, we're not going to see the kind of growth we saw in the last one because we haven't seen a big surge in reopenings. And what we continue to see every single day are new layoffs that reflect permanent job loss. These are layoffs where they're not planning to bring you back in four weeks or six weeks or whenever the virus is under control. And these are businesses that are looking forward to the next year and saying, you know what, we got to cut costs now or we're not going to survive. You know, Betsy, as you say, there could be new layoffs. There will be new layoffs. Um, many, many businesses we know are failing. United Airlines just announced that it could be laying off up to 95,000 people. The unemployment rate right now is just over 11 percent. So we have that on the one hand, but if, yet if we look at the stock market, the stock market is rising. There seems to be some kind of a disconnect in the economy here. How do you explain that? Well, I do think that that disconnect is a, a little tough to explain, but I, I will say that I think that the, the stock market is very optimistic for another stimulus package. What they've seen is uh, both monetary and fiscal policy has been united and trying to support the economy. And that's not just true in the United States, but that's been true in other countries as well. Um, so businesses uh, see that, uh, that, that you no know, government's going to be there for them. And we saw really spending, consumer spending, just plummet at the early days of the pandemic in March. But then we saw household incomes actually rise in April. Why did they rise? Because we had so much stimulus. So as long as the government's throwing money at the problem, mm -hmm. I think you're going to see the stock market pretty happy. Okay, let me bring in Mehmet. Mehmet, you are a small business owner. You own two uh, coffee and wine bars in the Arlington neighborhood here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I know that neighborhood very well. I live in that neighborhood. I've walked past your, one of your businesses uh, very often. What has your experience been? So I'm very optimistic as well. I really think that the thing that we talked about, you guys talked about earlier, actually, the V-shape, I see the economy as a V-shape as well. Uh, this is my personal guess as well. I, I mean, I'm here day to day. I did not shut the operation right away uh, in COVID. I try to keep it open, and I did to-go orders, and I try to go to hospitals and stuff like that. So people took it very seriously in the beginning. But I feel like people are now more laid back and relaxed about the situation. We live in an area, as you know, very young. Uh, a lot of college graduates, uh, number one choice is Arlington. So uh, most of them are, they want to get out. They want to go to the coffee shop. They want to go to the restaurant. They want their life back. You know, in the beginning, like all of us, we were as afraid a lot. But I feel like there's a big hope. And I see the hope every single day with the two of my coffee shops. So. I talk to a lot of customers. I talk to a lot of people about all this situation, the experience, and day to day. You know, every single day, I have many regulars, and I really think it's not going to be an L shape. I think it's going to be a V shape. We came down, and I think from now on, we're just going to go hope uh, up. You know, I mean, once the vaccine is found, everything will be back to normal. I feel like, and it'll be better than before. So, Mehmet, did you get any help from the federal government? We did. Uh, so. There was a program called PPP. We did get a loan through PPP, which helped us bring back some employees full time. I have uh, my second coffee shop, which is bigger in Clarendon. Uh, I had two people. Now we have about 10 people working uh, with the PPP, helped us a little bit. And then we also got that uh, SBA loan, yeah. uh, which, which put a big cushion behind us, you know. So, uh, so, Mehmet, let me ask you this. You know, you can open right now. You can serve customers, but there is limited seating. And I wonder, does that actually hurt your business because you have limited seating? Because you still have to pay salaries. You still have to buy supplies. You still have to pay chefs. You still have to pay the rent. Yeah. So with the rent, uh, the good thing is there was a lot of deferment programs, right? So they did push the rent back in three months. In my case, you know, March, April, May was deferred into 12 months starting in October. So with landlords, we have helped like that. And, you know, uh, phase two was 50% occupancy. Phase three in Virginia was uh, not a percentage, but still have a six feet uh, apart tables. Yeah. But you know, like I said in the beginning, a lot of people want to come out and they do want to grab and go. They, I mean, they, you know, they're just tired of sitting at home and you know, right. spending time at home. So the numbers are looking good, honestly. Uh, my numbers are not looking bad at all. 
Well, I'm glad to hear that. Betsy, uh, do you think the unemployment numbers will get worse? Uh, I don't think that they're going to get worse, but I don't think that they're really going to get better. So uh, most uh, most forecasters expect that we're really going to be stuck around 10 percent unemployment for a while, certainly through the election. Um, you know, I, I think there is a big question on the horizon, which is the uh, in two weeks, the additional payments to people who are getting unemployment insurance disappear. Those additional payments are what have really has really supported household incomes. It's why people are, are still going and uh, willing to pay for a coffee from Mammoth's coffee shop. I think a, a bigger issue, you know, right now he's worried about whether people can come in, whether they're afraid of the virus and the optimism is coming from the fact that people are ready to get out of their house. When incomes go away, people cut discretionary spending. And we're still at the early stages of that part of the recession. So, no, I think it is a little bit hard to forecast, but I think that's what's going to be the drag, and that's why we're just really not going to see very much more recovery over the next few months. We're going to see unemployment sort of sticking around that 10, 11 percent. Jim, uh, any word on another stimulus package from the United States Congress? Well, uh, as you heard there, in about two weeks or so, this expanded unemployment benefits will end. That gives people about 600 extra dollars a week. And, and indeed, many people, that's the difference between keeping a roof over their head and, and not. So as this uh, crisis has dragged on, uh, initially the White House was reluctant to go to extend those payments. Now they seem to be uh, an awareness that they may have no choice and a little bit more willingness. I think one thing that's important to keep in mind yeah. is this is really multiple different outbreaks and different crises. So a coffee shop in uh, the Washington, D.C. suburbs yeah. where things got worse and now are getting better, that may be a, a situation where you're seeing a V-shaped recovery, yeah. recovery. But that same coffee shop in Los Angeles is being closed down again this week really? by the governor there as the crisis gets worse. So I think you're going to see much different impact from city to city, region to region uh, throughout the United States. Honestly. Right. Mehmet, very quickly, I've got about 20 seconds. Uh, looking at current conditions right now, how long can you sustain that? When would you like to see a turnaround come? I mean, how long can you remain under the circumstances under which you are operating right now? So I think we're good until April. And I feel like that this year we talked about will yeah. come back right in April when the weather warms up again next year. I think that, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into okay. too deep. Yeah, but airlines and everything, hotels, I feel like everybody's coming back in April and we're going to have a great economy in April. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We are going to take a break right now. When we come back, what's behind the growing number of young people contracting COVID-19? Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. CGTN. Welcome back. As the pandemic continues, young people account for a growing percentage of new cases in the United States. According to a new study, about a third of young adults are now at risk of developing a severe case of the virus. Joining us from Los Angeles is Dr. Gary Richwald. He's a communicable and infectious disease expert and the chief medical officer with Real Health. Also with us is Raven McGregor. She was diagnosed with COVID-19 back in March and joins us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Raven, let me start with you. As I said, you were infected with the coronavirus. Uh, how do you think you got it in the first place? You know, it, it may have been at the gym, um, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure. And what were the symptoms that you first started showing? Law, well, let's see, I lost my taste and smell first, and then I had the high fever, um, the cough. I just felt really tired all the time, and the worst thing was the shortness of breath. And how long did that last? For about eight or nine days. And uh, do you still feel any of those symptoms, or have they completely gone away? 
So most of them are gone. I will say my my taste is a little bit different. Things are way spicier than they used to be. Um, and I do feel a little bit more tired than I normally do. But for the most part, I'd say most of the symptoms are gone. Now, you got a test. At what stage did you get that test? And how long did it take for you to get the results back? So I decided to get a test when I had um, a really high fever. I went to the doctor when I lost my taste and smell, and they thought it was a sinus infection. Um, but then all the symptoms kind of came at once, so I decided to go get tested. And it took about 14 days to get my results. It took 14 days to get your results back? That's not normal, is it? It's very unusual. It took a long time. Um, they said they were backlogged by, by a lot of tests. So, so by the time I received my results, I was already feeling better. Now, you say it was likely that you picked up this virus in the gym. Uh, what kind of precautions were you taking at that stage? Were you wearing a mask, uh, practicing social distancing, wearing gloves, uh, washing your hands, stuff like that? No, I'm embarrassed to say I was not. I kind of thought that, you know, since I was young and, and healthy that I wouldn't get it. So I wasn't wearing a mask for sure. Um, I was still going places until the governor mandated that we couldn't anymore. So, um, yeah, I, I wasn't taking the precautions that I should have taken. So given the fact that you thought that, you know, young people don't pick up the virus uh, so easily, were you surprised really when you were infected? I was so surprised. You know, when I lost my taste and smell, my friends kind of joked, like, oh, you have COVID. I was like, no, I don't have COVID. Um, but when I started feeling bad and I couldn't breathe and I felt like I was suffocating, that's when it really hit me, like, whoa, I'm not immune to this. No one's immune to this. Um, and I was like, people have to take this seriously. I have to try to talk to my friends and everyone that's not taking it seriously that are my age and that thinks that they're immune and just let them know, like, you know, you could, you could die of this. All right, let me bring Dr. Richwald into the conversation. Dr. Richwald, uh, Raven raises an important point there, a key point, and that is there is a common belief among young people that they are less likely to be infected by the coronavirus. Well, I, I think that's absolutely true, and also the doctors who take care of them share that same belief in many cases, that incorrect belief. Raven was first diagnosed with a sinus infection, and that was followed with an emergency room diagnosis of pneumonia. And at neither time, uh, because at the time of the pneumonia, she didn't have some of the reasons to get tested, at neither time was she um, recommended to have a test. So I think the medical profession uh, has something to do with the fact that we've really missed the boat when it comes to recognizing that individuals under 40 and under 30 can be a major cause of new infection, can have a major proportion of our new infections. And doctor, what do you make of the fact that uh, her test results took so long? Well, it's like the old and the new seem to be the same. It's, it's rather discouraging that at this time, we only are doing about 650,000 tests um, uh, a day in this country, and we really need to be doing somewhere around at least 1.5 or more. There are higher estimates. But the problem with getting tests so late is, first of all, people have misdiagnoses, so they end up infecting other people during that time period. Um, number two, they get mistreated. She received uh, azithromycin, a, a, an antibacterial, when, of course, she had a viral illness causing her pneumonia. And number three, when the results come back that late, the ability to do contact tracing for people to even remember their contacts and then for those contacts to be meaningfully reached out to and tested and prevention of further um, testing, you know, that, that goes uh, really down the drain. You can't do good contact tracing if you get results more than a few days later. And, and hers was, what, 14 days? I That's mean, right, yeah. It's appalling then, it's appalling now. Uh, Dr. Richwell, there's been some interesting new research that's come out from the Journal of Adolescent Health, uh, which shows that one in three young adults is at risk of severe COVID-19. That includes smokers. When you take them out, the numbers at risk drops in half. What do you make of that? 
well, of course, what does smokers mean? I mean, having looked at that article, um, it includes individuals who smoke cigarettes, who smoke marijuana, who you know use other inhaled type products. It's a good percentage. So I think, of course, we always recommend that uh, you know individuals who are under 30, in fact, all individuals, you know, reduce their smoking, especially in the face of COVID-19. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the article is is very clear. Adolescents, young adults are at increased risk because they do a lot more smoking than we know about. Raven, uh, how has your diagnosis and the ailment you went through affected uh, your friends? I mean, are they now more uh, cautious when they know that young people like you can be infected by the virus? I'd I'd say that the, ma the majority of them are. I think a lot of them, um, after hearing my experience, take it more seriously, or I have some that were just really taking it seriously before. And so now they're like, we know someone that had this. She um, had it really bad. So we need to continue to do what we're doing. We need to social distance. We need to wear our masks. So I think that me having it has helped a lot of my friends take it more seriously, but it then has also made some of my other friends probably not worry as much because I recovered and I'm okay. Um, so there is also that mindset that's like, all right, well, if I get it, I'll be fine. I'll get better. So I'd say it's about half and half. And of course, there must be some degree of frustration as well, Raven, because, you know, young people, they want to go to the beach. It's great weather. They want to go to restaurants. They want to go to bars. Do they, do they get frustrated? 100% frustrated. <laughs> um, I'd say almost all of my friends are like tired of this and they're just ready to go out and they're ready to, you know, vacation like normal. I think most of them understand that this is just what it is. You know, we just have to wait it out and do what we have to do to protect ourselves and others. And I feel like there's other people that are really, like you said, they're, they're fed up. They're ready to, to get back to their, their normal routines. Dr. Richwald, I'm going to look at a breakdown around the country. We look at the state of Arizona, nearly half of coronavirus cases there are people 20 to 44 years old. Uh, we look at the state of Florida, which is now an epicenter. Uh, it's seen a shift towards adults in their 20s and 30s. We look at the city of Chicago in Illinois, is seeing a similar surge among 18 to 29 year olds. Um, and, you know, many states, as we are fully aware, have reopened bars, they've reopened restaurants. California just yesterday uh, shut down actually they went back and shut down their bars uh, indoor dining as well as gyms but uh, you know we've also seen people as i just said flocking to the beach because of the warmer weather is this part of what is driving up these numbers i think there's no question about that that we have a certain wonderful season and weather in florida well maybe florida is a little hot but in, uh, in across this Sun Belt in the United States. And there's a, a big drive to uh, forget about social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera. But in order to do this properly, we need clear and persistent messages and persistent messages from the top. And when they don't come from the president, then they have to come from the governors. And the governors of Arizona and Florida have been severely deficient in putting out clear messages. They keep changing their message, and I think this is very destructive. And in Washington, they've now moved on to schools, and the whole issue of young adults like Raven and, and her, her um, group, uh, that's almost been forgotten now. And uh, so, you know, Washington has been a series of jumping around. This is not what we call clear and persistent mess messages. Yeah, you know, Doctor, you mentioned the uh, question of schools uh, being reopened. Uh, President Trump wants schools to be reopened. Uh, he's even threatening to defund schools if they don't reopen. Uh, I'm not sure whether he could do that. Uh, and he's also threatened foreign students who attend uh, U.S. universities and colleges with deportation if they are not going back to classes, in other words, being in person in classes. I mean, what is your view on that? I mean. Uh, is there any part of the country now which is ready to reopen schools? You know, there may be a state like New Hampshire or, you know, there may be a few states that can safely do this. But rather than putting out punitive messages and saying you must do this, you must, exp you know, you must uh, send out of the country 
all of these uh, overseas students. USC, where I taught, where I teach, about uh, 20 to 25 percent of the students are from overseas. Rather than doing that, these these uh, universities and, and elementary and high schools need to receive support and funds for PPE, for testing, et cetera. Can you imagine what's going to happen to our testing system in the United States if people actually listen to Trump and they brought all these schools online and all these teachers and students needed to be regularly tested? It would be a complete catastrophe. It will be a complete catastrophe. And the idea that rapid testing, as I heard from the Surgeon General this morning, is going to miraculously solve the problem and pool testing is absolutely ridiculous. Raven, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the country's foremost expert in infectious diseases, he's head of the NIH, he's been talking about infections among young people. Let's listen to part of what he had to say. The overwhelming majority now of people getting infected are young people, likely the people that you see in the clips and in the paper who are out in crowds enjoying themselves, understandably. No blame there, understandably. But the thing that you really need to realize that when you do that, you are part of a process. So if you get infected, you will infect someone else who clearly will infect someone else. So what do you make of that, Raven? I mean, the doctor makes a good point there, doesn't he? Uh, because young people may think, look, you know, we're young, we're healthy, we're not going to get infected, or even if we do get infected, it's not going to affect us that much. But, you know, Dr. Fauci makes the point there that you could infect other people, uh, your parents or your grandparents, for that matter. I agree with everything he said. You know, um, I did have that selfish mindset, like many young people have now, where they're like, you know, I'll get it, I'll get over it. Um, but now I have to remember that I could get it again. I could be fine, show no symptoms, but then I could give it to someone else that may not make it. You know, um, same with my friends. They could get it. They may have no symptoms. They may feel a little bad, but they may spread it to their uncle or their, or their grandparents that, that may die. So I think that's what we have to think about here is um, thinking more than about ourselves, but think about others, too. I mean, it's the least that we can do. So, Raven, you've been through this virus, you've been in, infected, you've recovered. What would your advice be to other young people as everybody is trying to navigate this pandemic right now? Just to realize, you know, that we're not immune. You know, we can get it. Um, but even worse than that, we can give it to someone that may not make it. You know, so it's, it's bigger than us. We really need to do our part. You know, wear your mask, social distance. Um, we can still go out to nature parks and beaches and stuff and social distance. You know, you don't have to go out with a big group of friends. Um, so your life's not over doing this right now. Just just be smart about it and and just do your best not to be around a lot of other people that you can that you can get sick. That's what I would say. Wear a mask, social distance, um, and and just care about others ultimately. Raven McGregor, Dr. Gary Richwell, thanks to both of you for being with us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.